must have been to Hard Rock Park. Get lost in the 70s or any of our other rock-themed zones only at Hard Rock Park, where rock comes to play. My name's Max and welcome to the newest episode of This is a thing that I did in my childhood, I really did this, and this is a thing that other people actually experience. Anyways, does anybody else remember that Hard Rock Cafe amusement park? Deep in the dark depths of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina laid a theme park. But not just any theme park, this was the start of something new. A black sheep in the Six Flagses and Disney's of the world. The question was, what if you took industry veterans and amusement park trailblazers and tried to make something brand new in one of the South's fastest growing cities? Through trials, tribulations, and $400 million lost faster than an 18-year-old holding GameStop stock, Hard Rock Park went from being an exciting addition to a bustling tourist town to being literal rubble in less than two years. It should have been a slam dunk, so what went wrong? But before we get into that, don't forget to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, comment down below what your favorite Hard Rock Cafe menu item is. Let's go! The year is 2006. Florida entrepreneur and theme park veteran John Binkowski decides he wants to break off from his work at SeaWorld and make something that was completely his. He had been running the Ice Castle Theater, a venue that hosted a show with the figure skater that Tanya Harding bashed with a metal pole, but traction was rough. So what's the first thing you think of when you want to get butts in seats? I'll give you a hint. It isn't news stories, it isn't billboards, and it isn't radio. He decided he wanted to make his own theme park, and that was kind of where the idea ended. Originally, he pitched a smaller, unlikely licensed theme park based around the Four Seasons as a way to create a wider appeal and save some money. In comes Stephen Goodwin, the man that would later become Hard Rock Park CEO, who took Binkowski's idea and said, absolutely not. We need to go bigger. Originally, Goodwin pitched doing an MGM theme park at the time, which was already a thing, so they decided to reel it back. Then Goodwin remembers he used to work at everyone's favorite overpriced chicken shack and medium well burger shop, the Hard Rock Cafe. Is your stomach fluttering? Palms sweaty me too it was gold to quote goodwin the nascar types would like it the bikers would like it the families love it and the spring breakers would visit and saying it now it kind of does seem like a slam dunk hard rock is a recognizable brand internationally that not only has fans that go visit myrtle beach already but they also collect these little pins and spend lots of money on it and i really don't understand this part of it but anyways once they got hard rock attached to the project money starts pouring in it's 2006 nothing could go wrong. That's foreshadowing. They raised $320 million in a few months and they break ground in 2007. 2008 rolls around and people are ecstatic. Give us the Hard Rock theme park! The crowd roars from outside the gates. We want to ride the- Wait, is anything here actually good? The answer is... Yes. Live from my office, it's the Hard Rock Park rides from 2008 to 2008 with special guests in 1975 and Jenna Ortega. And now for your host, me, but from a green screen, also in my office. Hard Rock Park is boomer heaven. Take the ideas of the rock and roller coaster, the odd theming, the music on the ride, the, hey, how about some backstage passes? Not actually that part, I just really like that part. Take all of that and just build a park around it. Let's pay a bunch of old white dudes millions of dollars to take some okay rides and turn them into things that people will remember. We have Eagles, Life in the Fast Lane. It's a little roller coaster that puts you in the classic old Eagles abandoned warehouse and plays the music and it goes, ah, you have maximum RPM. It's a roller coaster, but instead of going chugga 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 up the hill, it's like a Ferris wheel and it connects you into the roller coaster at the top and then you go, whoa! They made this cool dark ride based on the Moody Blues song Nights in White Satin where it's all black light and trippy and you wear those old cardboard 3D glasses. And then you have the creme de la creme of it all, Led Zeppelin the ride. You get on a coaster and you're in a big Zeppelin get it? And the whole thing is time to a whole lot of love. On top of that, they had all of this other cool stuff. Like they had this spinny ride where you're in British taxis and they got the license for that 70s TV show, The Banana Split. So they had walk around characters and they had this kid's ride that was based on a mushroom trip. It's all just super charming and the theming made it one cohesive thing, even though everything was really distinct. It was really cool. Green screen part over. So the park is huge and the time had come. John and Steven are ready to cut the ribbon. A humble affair 
care for a humble and level-headed founding duo. Would be the responsible thing to do. Instead, they spent reportedly $250,000 to have the Eagles and the Moody Blues play a concert to usher in their cash cow. And on that fateful day, April 15th, 2008, Hard Rock Park opened to the public. And the reception was good. People liked the park. The rides are fun, there's lots of stuff to do, and it feels like a breath of fresh air for the theme park industry. And I would know, here's a bunch of pictures of me that my mom dug out when we visited Hard Rock Park during its first season. I was a little tiny, little, tiny little boy, but I remembered really liking this. We used to go to Myrtle Beach in the summers and my family loves theme parks, so it was kind of the perfect match. So things are looking good. John and Steven are kind of in the clear. Nothing could go wrong. And then pretty much exactly after they opened the park. Listen, I'm not a finance guy, but remember the big short? And how the US housing market crashed and everybody lost their homes and stopped making money and stopped going on trips and it was kind of the biggest financial event since the Great Depression? One of those happened. And almost immediately, Hard Rock Park is in trouble. By midsummer, attendance is dropping drastically. And low attendance can sometimes not be the most negative thing in the entire world, but it all depends on size. And Hard Rock Park is big and it was expensive to run. And not only was it expensive to run, but all of the boomers they were paying to put their faces on these rides, they were expensive too. And they needed to get paid. And John and Steven, who just got through $400 million, they were coming up a little short. It was reported that in all of 2008, Hard Rock Park made around $21 million in income, which is like a 19th of what it cost to make the park. So with their backs turned to the wall and nowhere else to go, John and Steven gave up. They hung up their hats after only one season and sold their park to a company called called MT Development for only $25 million. Instead, the park became Freestyle Music Park, a name I still don't really understand, and every ride became Generic Music Ride. Led Zeppelin the ride turned into Time Machine, and even though they kept the big Zeppelin, they also just played regular rock music now. Eagle's Life in the Fast Lane had a similar fate, turning into Iron Horse. What has to be the most drastic overhaul, though, is the Knights in White Satin ride turning into everybody's favorite dark ride, the Monster stars of rock. What some consider to be one of the greatest new dark rides in all of America turned into this shitty cardboard thing. And because of the loss of the hard rock licensing, they had to change every name in the park. They had to destroy every piece of merchandise. Even down to the smallest things like the names of the lands. Like British Invasion turned into Across the Pond. And Cool Country turned into Country USA. And Born in the USA turned into Kids in America. Like they kept all of the signage, they just changed the words. There were things you obviously couldn't move like a giant blimp, but because of the theming, most of these rides were able to change over pretty easily. And for me, this is one of the most interesting parts of the Hard Rock Park story. When John set out to make a theme park, he didn't intend on making something that was $400 million and had all of this licensing. He wanted to make something small and unlicensed. But because of how things played out, you kind of get to see that experiment unfold. You get to see both sides of the story. So did it work when it was completely unlicensed? No, in fact, even with no licensing fees and how little they paid for the park, they still couldn't pull it together. Paired with the fact that, oh, I don't know, the entire economy collapsed, Freestyle Park was in trouble. So all of that was bad, but then on top of that, they already owed millions of dollars to creditors from the overhaul, and all of the debt they took on when they bought the park. As the park closed for the season that summer, Freestyle Park's president said, quote, we're doing our best and we're here to stay. So they closed the gates and they literally never opened them ever again. That was it. The bank foreclosed on the park and it sat dormant ever since. They sold most of the rides to this Vietnamese theme park, but by the time they actually got to them, most of them didn't even work. Many attempts were made at selling the land to different groups in Myrtle Beach. My favorite story about this though is this Christian activist group called Abiding Village wanted to buy the park. I think they wanted to raise $10 million to make the theme park from Righteous Gemstones or something, but they came up $9 million short, so they decided to do a yard sale, and they only raised $156,000, which is still a lot for a yard sale. Like, what are they selling here? So that didn't pan out, and then for a while, investors from China we're gonna buy the land and buy up a bunch of land in Myrtle Beach to make Chinese cultural centers. And the local government was so excited they went on the record to talk about how Mandarin was gonna be taught in schools soon. This didn't happen, but like a month ago, that Chinese spy balloon was literally shot down over Myrtle Beach, so maybe there's like a lover's quarrel thing happening here. This is what Hard Rock Park looks like now. There's a ton of cool videos of people going to the outside of the park and even some videos of people going inside and everything is just decrepit and broken. All of the windows are smashed, all the buildings have been ransack, but there's still like parts of the signs up. You can still tell it's a theme park. It's just crazy that like this is a place that I used to go when I was a kid. I watch all of these abandoned theme park videos on YouTube and it's one of those things that just feels so far away and then you remember that you actually went to one of them. 
After its closure, most of the team went to places like Disney and Universal, and John actually spearheaded Shanghai Disneyland. Do I think that Hard Rock Park would be successful if the entire economy didn't collapse right after its opening? Maybe. I think there was something there. I think the industry is lacking in independent theme parks in the US, and Hard Rock Park was genuinely trying to do something different. But I don't know, I was literally seven, like this could have really sucked. It could have been bad. They could have literally set $400 million on fire and then just thrown a couple carnival rides out there. But maybe not. Thanks so much for watching. If you made it this far, give the video a big thumbs up and comment down below what your favorite music related theme park in South Carolina is. Okay, see you next week. Bye.